Will you please join with me now in a moment of prayer? Gracious God, we thank you for this time of worship, this time of Sabbath, in which we gather together in your loving presence. Here in this time, in this place, and in this community, may we find rest and renewal, inspiration and instruction, nurture and nourishment. Amen. On this Labor Day weekend, we are invited to celebrate and offer our gratitude for all who labor for our common good in various ways. Labor Day isn't just about barbecues. It began in the 19th century in the United States to, as an effort because workers and labor unions organized to bring awareness to the societal contributions of the working class in particular, but the contributions of all laborers, of course. It was intended to be a holiday for all workers, and it still is for some workers, not all. And they hoped that raising awareness would bring broader commitment to those workers, ensuring that they had the things they needed, like safe working conditions and reasonable hours and good wages. This is still an ongoing effort within our society, of course. And so perhaps this Labor Day invites us to ponder this issue for ourselves and also to consider how we support workers in our communities. As I was thinking about work and all of these things, including the many types of work that people do in the world and their contributions, your contributions to our collective life, especially those essential workers on whom we depend, I was also thinking about our work together as a church and our work in collaboration with other communities of faith, and other organizations that are doing good work, important work, here in our city and in our broader world. You know, in some ways, Christianity has had a complicated relationship with work throughout history, particularly how good works and faith are related. Some people over the centuries have expressed concern about the danger of focusing too much on works righteousness. Has anyone ever heard that phrase before? I'm just curious. Some people have, some people maybe not. Yeah. So essentially that notion that we, are, we might be required to do certain things, follow certain rules, engage in certain rituals and practices to earn God's grace and love. It's a fair question to, to raise. And of course, it's important for us to remember right off the bat that God's grace and love come first. We don't have to earn God's love. God just loves. That's what God does. That's who God is. You know, some of this concern about works righteousness developed because Paul, who we heard from today, James, and other leaders and thinkers of the early church we're trying to figure out how the practice of the law within their own Jewish tradition and those practices, you know, that they had inherited from their ancestors, how that fit with the new, newly developing Christian tradition that was forming. How did those fit together? And these early thinkers weren't all in agreement. So we see some back and forth between them. I always appreciate um, what John Dominic Crossan has to say about reading the epistles in the New Testament. We ought to remember that we're reading somebody else's mail. Yeah. So sometimes if we don't understand what they're getting at or why he's so fixated on something, we kind of have to think, okay, what might be going on in this community that he's writing to? So they weren't all in agreement. And one of the really sticky issues was whether or not Gentile converts needed to follow all of the Jewish laws and customs. Paul said that they didn't, but others disagreed. So there's some back and forth about that. This concern popped up again during the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther, for example, was passionate that each individual was a recipient of God's grace through faith. He and other reformers questioned whether the church hierarchy of their day was putting too much stock in being an intermediary between the people and God. 
were they actually maybe putting up some roadblocks by requiring certain practices from people in exchange for the assurance of God's grace? Were they taking advantage of people at times? These were legitimate questions. And as it turned out, they led to reforming movements both, within, both with the Protestant traditions that developed and also within the Catholic Church in that time period that followed. Now, unfortunately, some of this concern about works righteousness has also had some ugly side effects throughout history. At times, it has been accompanied by anti-Jewish rhetoric that misunderstands the role and purpose of the law within the practice of Judaism. It's been accompanied sometimes by anti-Catholic rhetoric from some Protestants whose knowledge about the practice of the sacraments within Catholicism is, let's face it, a little shallow. Neither of those are helpful, I think, because, especially when it comes to building interfaith respect and collaboration. We need to do a little better about how we talk about this, and we ought to treat this question with care. Nevertheless, this theological question of works and faith seems to have persisted throughout time. It's popped up at various phases. Now, we may not believe in a God who requires something of us in exchange for God's love and grace. I certainly don't. But the founder of our faith, Jesus, right, and one of his biggest PR guys, the Apostle Paul, who we heard from today, both offer some clear ideas about the kind of good and loving work we ought to do. There is a difference between works righteousness and righteous work or good work. We don't engage in the good work of love because we have to or because we expect something for, from it, that we have to earn God's grace. God's love is already there. God's love is, in fact, the starting place for our work. So our work is then a response to God's love. Our work is an illustration of God's love. We engage in good work from a place of gratitude, hopefully, although sometimes we have our moments. Maybe I'm alone in that. <laughs> sometimes we grumble through our work, let's be honest, but you know, most days on our best days, we start from a place of gratitude and we start with a desire to share, to serve, to care for others. And in doing so, God's love is amplified and experienced through our good work. This is at the heart of the practice of our faith. We don't set out to earn God's love by doing good work, but often we do experience God's love in the process of doing good work, and so do others. I know some of you have felt that before, right? The Apostle Paul knew and experienced this too, I think, and he wanted to encourage and inspire the church in Rome. The church in Rome wasn't actually one of the ones that he helped form, but it was one that he hoped to go visit. And that's when he's writing this letter from Corinth. He's talking about potentially going to see them. And like all of his letters, he writes to this community with some urgency and passion, calling them to be the church in the world. He urged them to live into the vision of the reign of God within their community as if it were already here on earth. Paul called them to embody the values of the kingdom of God, even as they lived under the difficult reality of the kingdom of Rome. Now, I hardly need to preach, because really, didn't Trish do a fabulous job reading this text? That was beautiful. She even had gestures to go with every phrase. I loved it. You know, the values that Paul lifts up in chapter 12 are the values that Jesus embodied. And they are countercultural values in many ways, especially in that they stand in contrast to the cultural conventions of hierarchy and social stratification. Those were very true back in Rome. They're still true to some degree now, aren't they? Let love be genuine, Paul says. Hold fast to the good. Practice mutual affection. Honor one another. Love is the place where Paul starts. Paul starts with love because love is the foundation for everything that follows in this litany of good works. 
Paul urges them to be passionate in their faith and service. He encourages them to find joy in hope, patience in suffering, and perseverance in prayer. Help those in need, he says. Practice hospitality to strangers. Express compassion and solidarity with each other in joy and in hardship. Remember, we rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Life is not always easy, and Paul definitely knew that. He had his share of ups and downs and trials and tribulations. And so he's coming from that experience as well as he's writing. So he knows from his own personal experiences, he knows from visiting these various churches that he helped form, that they have some challenges too, right? Difficulties and conflicts arise. Read 1 Corinthians if you want to get a glimpse of some of that. There's a lot in there. So how the Roman church that he's writing to now, how they choose to respond to and manage their personal challenges and their interpersonal conflicts and their societal struggles all matter. All of those challenges must be addressed with love also. Live in harmony with one another, Paul says. I like that metaphor of harmony. Play your part and play it well. Your contribution to the whole is what makes music. And guess what? You don't always have to be the one playing or singing the melody or taking the lead. Shout out to all my altos <laughs> and tenors and basses. <laughs> we all have a part to play. Sometimes we do take the lead. Sometimes we offer a harmonizing element, right? But together, that's what makes the music sing. Differences of opinion and perspectives arise in community. Paul knew that well, so he advises the Romans not to be pompous. Don't be haughty. Don't be wiser than you are. And when facing their enemies, Paul implores them not to retaliate, not to enact vengeance. The only way to overcome evil is with good. Practice peace. Feed your hungry enemies, says Paul. Give them a drink of water when they are thirsty. We're hearing echoes of some of the Sermon on the Mount in here, aren't we? Turn the other cheek. If someone takes your shirt or your cloak, give them your shirt as well. So Paul is coming from that perspective. And it's important for us to remember that Paul is writing this letter to what was at that time a fringe religious movement of countercultural Jesus-loving people, both, both Jews and Gentiles, and they were of various socioeconomic backgrounds. They were a mix, but they were all living, living under a very powerful imperial structure. And probably some of them wanted to rise up and start even a violent rebellion against Rome. It's understandable because that's what people do when they're facing oppression, right? But Paul believed that wouldn't end well. Um, turns out he was right later on that century the people of Judea and Jerusalem tried to rise up, and Rome squashed them pretty substantially. Paul also had faith that God would work it all out in the end. Now, he hoped it would all work out sooner rather than later. Within his lifetime, perhaps, or within a generation, obviously that didn't happen, because here we are still trying to work it out, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. And Paul may have hoped for a quicker resolution that didn't materialize, but I think his faith in God's faithfulness to humanity is right on. And that's a lesson to us, I think, that we ought to receive from this text, that God is faithful to humanity. Doesn't always work out on our timeline. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what our role is in all of that. But faith in God's faithfulness is a big part of our tradition. And so his advice to the Roman church is important for us to consider, I think, both personally and collectively. Now, I admit when it comes to modern international politics, things can get pretty complicated pretty quickly, obviously. But Paul's perspective 
is that vengeance is not ours to enact. And the imperial program is not ours to enact either. We're not supposed to act like Rome. Our job is to live out the values of Jesus. Biblical scholar Daniel Kirk puts it this way, if we are to be the body of Christ, which is an image, of course, that Paul brings up many times, that we are the body of Christ, then we must actively embody the story of Jesus in our lives. We do that individually in our daily living, and we do that in community together. And we do that to the best of our ability out in the world. We are to always remember that as the body of Christ, we are members of one another. And if we are to truly embody the crucified and resurrected one, then we cannot act like the crucifier. I found that to be a powerful statement from Daniel Kirk. We cannot act like the crucifier. We have to refuse to embody the crucifier. Instead, we must stand with the crucified and resurrected one. We must stand for liberation and life. We must embody the resurrecting love of God. This comes as no great surprise. Of course, we're called to follow in the way of Jesus, right? That's the heart of our tradition. We talk about it all the time. We're doing it to the best of our ability. But we also know that humanity has always struggled to live in this way, and especially in the ways of humility, the ways of peace, the ways of justice, the ways of healing. So there is still much work for us to do. So if our labor as the church is the labor of life, then we have to find ways to address the forces that kill. Those that kill our planet and its creatures by pollution, by habitat destruction. Those that kill people by violence, by lack of basic needs. Those that kill people's spirits by hate, by lack of respect and dignity. We must speak life into the places of death, for we are a people who proclaim resurrection. It's as urgent now as it was for Paul, even more so in some ways. He faced the Roman Empire. That was no small thing. But we're facing a climate crisis. Paul knew plenty of people who were poor and lacked the basic necessities. So do we, don't we? Even more, in fact, in our own neighborhoods and across the globe. Did you know that approximately 2 billion people don't have reliable access to clean drinking water? 2 billion. That's a quarter of the Earth's population. We face some challenges Paul couldn't have even imagined we are more globally connected than ever before, and there are 8 billion of us. That brings interpersonal and international relationships to a whole new level, doesn't it? Fun fact, in Paul's day, the Earth's population was probably about two or 300 million, less than the current population of the United States. He was living in a different world. There are 8 billion of us. It's doubled in my lifetime. Ideologies and theologies and socio-political policies that are too individualistic are no longer an option with 8 billion people. Our highest commitment has to be to each other. And I believe God's highest commitment has always been to this world and its people as a whole, not just some, not just certain populations. And so God is still calling us to engage in some righteous work, some righteous work of love. Now, truthfully, sometimes I can get a little overwhelmed by these big problems. I feel pretty useless now and then in the face of climate change or global poverty. In my better moments, though, I don't dissolve into tears and despair, although now and then I do, frankly. But when I remember two things, it keeps me going. One, stop and breathe, Susie. <laughs> breathe. Take a deep breath. Pause. Rest. 
And two, though I do have a part to play, it's not all up to me. There are other players. There is God's spirit working amongst us. We're all in this together. Sikh activist and author Valerie Kaur talks about the work of bringing more love and justice into the world as a birthing process. And like a mother in labor, there are moments when we must pause from the hard work and breathe through it. We can't sustain the work of love for very long unless we take a moment to breathe and find the right balance or the right rhythm that keeps us going. Frankly, that's good advice, no matter what kind of work we're talking about, whether we're talking about big issues, addressing the big problems, or just our regular everyday tasks. We all got to hit the pause button now and then, am I right? You know, people are always talking about finding work-life balance. It's not an easy thing to do. Anyone know anybody who's really good at that? Because I'd love to talk to them. <laughs> it's a challenge sometimes, right? And balance is a fine word for sure. But for me, I actually tend to prefer the word rhythm. Maybe because it's more musical and dynamic and I'm better at rhythm than I am at balance. <laughs> but whatever word you choose, what is the balance or rhythm of work and rest that sustains you for the long haul? And how does connecting with God fit into that balance or rhythm? How about connecting with your loved ones? What are the practices that sustain you for the long haul? We have to revisit these questions regularly, I think. The balance or rhythm we need in different times and seasons of our lives can vary. That's OK. So we need to pause. We're called to pause, to reassess now and then and then figure out how do I need to be spending my time and energy in this season of my life? And where am I gonna find those moments to recharge, reconnect, and keep me going? In order to share God's love broadly and extravagantly, in order to engage in righteous work together to address the big needs of our day, in order to just keep going with our daily living, we have to ground ourselves in God's love. We have to practice deep and full living that allows us to be present and open to God, open and present to ourselves, open and present to one another. So my invitation to you this morning is once again, take a moment to breathe. Take a deep breath. Take a moment to rest. Know that God's love is deep within you. Indeed, it never leaves. Let it fill you. Let it nourish you. Let it overflow through you into this world. Breathe, rest, and when you are ready, Continue your good work, my friends. Continue your labor for love and life. And speak resurrection into this world, because this world needs your voice. Amen.